The basilar artery is one of those really short blood vessels that happens to be incredibly important. Um, so we're going to look at the anatomy of the basilar artery from the perspective of what I think students struggle with. That is where it is exactly and the names of its branches. It's called the basilar artery because we're going to the, the base of the skull, way up in there. That's where we're going to find it, but like on the inside of the bone. So in the neck, we've got these cracking great big arteries here. This is the common carotid artery, which is going to become those major branches, but running up in the vertebrae, so in the, the transverse um, processes, there are, he's just about seeing there, there are two other arteries, there's a left one and a right one. These arteries running in the vertebrae are called the vertebral arteries, and those vertebral arteries will ascend, do a beautiful little wiggle up here, pass through foramen magnum, into the cranial cavity, and those two vertebral arteries will come together to form a single basilar artery. So hopefully, immediately, we see why the basilar artery is so important. It's because it's going to supply blood to the brain. But there's even more to it than that if we look inside. Okay, so now we're looking at the cranial floor. You can see that midline single artery there, that's the basilar artery, and you can kind of see the left and right vertebral arteries that have entered the cranial cavity and come together to form the basilar artery. So the basilar artery is going to run up this slope. This slope is called the clevis, which apparently is the Latin word for slope. Um, now, what is here where my finger is? What is next to the clevis? What is next to the basilar artery. Here is the brain. These are the cerebral hemispheres. This is the cerebrum. I'm going to turn it over and there we see the basilar artery. We'll come back to that. Let me pluck it out. Now I know we're looking at this upside down. Well, maybe I can turn this around. These models tend to fall apart upside down. So here are the cerebral hemispheres. This is the cerebrum. This is where a lot of the complicated stuff is. So down here, we can see the brainstem, which is made up of the medulla oblongata, the pons and the midbrain. And the brainstem is linking the cerebrum with the spinal cord, so the rest of the body. It's linking it to the cerebellum, the little brain over here. The, most of the cranial nerves are coming out of the brainstem, and the brainstem is responsible for respiration, heart rate, blood pressure, sleep weight cycle, consciousness. Um, all of those, well, all of those basic vital functions, which means that if the brainstem is damaged, it doesn't matter if the cerebrum is okay. A damaged brainstem is not survivable. Well, you know, a significantly damaged brainstem. Uh, this is what in the UK uh, the law refers to as brain death. If the brainstem is destroyed, then the person might be supported by a ventilator and other apparatus, and the cerebrum might be just fine. But you cannot survive without your brainstem. So if your brainstem is destroyed, you will not survive without a uh, ventilator, so you are unfortunately brain dead. And the basilar artery is running between the bone and the brainstem. So yeah, it's supplying blood to the brainstem. That's why it's so important. Let me just go back to the skull for a moment. So I said that this slope of bone running from here to the foramen magnum, that slope is called the clevis. Now, that slope is, so this is posterior, this is anterior, and this is more superior, and this is more inferior, right? So the clevis is sloping superiorly and anteriorly, right? So it's going up at an angle like that. 
that will help us with the names of some of the blood vessels we're going to try and remember. So the clevus is sloping superiorly and anteriorly. Okay, so here we are again. There's the clevus with the basilar artery. Now you can see the two vertebral arteries down here coming together to form the basilar artery. And you saw that the cerebellum is lying in these posterior cranial fossae, these spaces back here. Um, and we can see a couple of arteries running posteriorly. These are cerebellar arteries. Now you've got to be careful here. Cerebrum, cerebellum, cerebellum being the little brain. Funny that, because the cerebellum has got about 70 billion neurons and the cerebrum's only got about, I don't know, between 15 and 20 billion neurons, something like that. Anyway, cerebellum, because you've got to get the word right, um, you've got to get the sounds right, you've got to spell it right, otherwise, you're naming the wrong artery because there are cerebral arteries and cerebellar arteries. Back here, these are the pica, the posterior inferior cerebellar arteries. These are the pica, the posterior inferior cerebellar arteries, because there are going to be some anterior inferior cerebellar arteries. But if you are eagle-eyed, you'll see that these posterior inferior cerebellar arteries are actually branching from the vertebral arteries. We're not at the basilar artery yet, they're coming from over here. So these first pair of cerebellar arteries are from the vertebral arteries. It's when we ascend up here, now what can we see? Hmm, we can see lots of branches. Well, I know that the next pair of arteries will be the aica, the anterior inferior cerebellar arteries. Do you see what I mean? We've gone from posterior to anterior, because we're going from posterior to anterior, but also we're going up the slope, so we're going to go from inferior to superior. Honestly, this logic will help you remember the names. So posterior inferior cerebellar arteries, then the next pair are the anterior inferior cerebellar arteries. If we look at this model, can you see? <laughs> Difficult for me to point because oh, bits are going to fall off. There's the basilar artery there. Um, you can see the vertebral arteries here and here. That then will be a posterior inferior cerebellar artery, a pica. And we can see, oh, well, I can see one artery here and one artery here, and there's a branch there. We'll come to that one in a moment. The first pair of arteries, the first major pair of arteries that are branching from the basilar artery here then are going to be the aica the anterior inferior cerebellar arteries. Now, I reckon that this branch we can see here is gonna be the labyrinthine artery, also known as the auditory artery or the internal auditory artery. Hopefully all those words give you clues as to where it's going. Now, we can't see where it's going, so I have to assume a little bit. Ideally, I'd like to see where it's going and then I am confident in naming it but the labyrinthine artery, in about 85% of people, is a branch from the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, the aica. So the labyrinth, we can't, we can't really see it on the other side. So let's compare that to the other model. Oh yeah, that, that's nice. Potentially confusing, but also nice. Um, so here's the basilar artery. The first pair of arteries are going to be the anterior inferior cerebellar arteries. But I can see this artery here. There's a pair of arteries coming straight off the basilar artery, but I can see it running over here. It's running into the internal acoustic meatus. Uh, now running in here, I can see a nerve. This is gonna be the vestibulocochlear nerve and the facial nerve running in here because that's the petrous part of the temporal bone there. In there is the inner ear. So in there is the cochlea and the vestibular apparatus. So that there is the labyrinthine artery running from the basilar artery 
into the internal acoustic meatus and to the structures of the inner ear. It's going to supply blood to the cochlea and the vestibular apparatus. And in about 15% of people, maybe, this is the configuration, the labyrinthine arteries branch from the basilar artery and go out there. There are, there's another like 1%, okay, that adds up to 101%, but you know what I mean. Um, there's another, like in some people, um, the labyrinthine arteries can branch off another artery nearby, but usually the labyrinthine arteries either most commonly come from the acre or can come from the basilar artery. We can also see that as the basilar artery goes, it gives off three to five pairs of little pontine branches. So as it goes along the brainstem, it is directly supplying blood to the brainstem. And those branches are pretty tiny. And the brainstem is hugely important. Now, as we ascend, as we follow the basilar artery up to its end, this is where, <laughs> this is where it ends here. Look, see how long it is? That's the entire basilar artery. It is very short. As we get to the, the superior end, the top end of the basilar artery, be very, very careful because before it ends, it will give off two branches, uh, a left and a right superior cerebellar artery. And those are going to run around to the cerebellum as well. So it gives off superior cerebellar arteries, and then it ends as the posterior cerebral artery. So a left and right posterior cerebral artery. And the posterior cerebral arteries will, well, they'll kind of supply the posterior parts of the cerebrum, the occipital lobes, part of the temporal lobes, and that sort of thing. Now, if we look at this on the other model, you've got to look really carefully, haven't you? Again, there's the basilar artery, and then just before it ends, it gives off the left and right superior cerebellar arteries, and then just after it, right next to it, the basilar artery ends as the left and right posterior cerebral arteries. Tricky, you've got to be very careful with your eyes, you've got to be very careful with your syllables, you've got to be very careful with uh, seeing where these go to, all right? If you want to see where that uh, posterior cerebral artery goes to, so that's it there, that is, this is, it's all this over here, right? Okay, so if we put all of that anatomy together, and we consider the basilar artery, um, what are we worried about? Well, we're worried about things like atherosclerosis, you know, cardiovascular disease in the vertebral arteries. If that was to throw off a clot, a thrombus, and it to pass up here, and if it was to completely occlude the basilar artery, well, that would be catastrophic, right? Um, that is a cause of sudden death. Um, and if it didn't do that, then it could cause complete paralysis of everything, including the muscles of respiration. It could affect, you know, it could cause altered consciousness. And we'll talk about the other regions that this, these arteries supply, but, you know, you're going to see effects on the cranial nerves, effects on vision, effects on things that are, you know, all the sensory stuff from the spinal cord is passing up to the brain, all the motor stuff from the brain. Do you know what I mean? But complete occlusion of the basilar artery is fortunately rare. However, um, of all strokes, posterior circulation strokes, that is taking into account the blood vessels we've been talking about, posterior circulation strokes account for about 20 to 25% of all strokes, right? So it's more likely that a clot will go up the basilar artery, then out a, along one of its branches. So what problems is that likely to occur, uh, cause? Well, if the thrombus passes out through a cerebellar artery and occludes blood flow to part of the cerebellum, well, you will see cerebellar signs. The cerebellum is involved in balance, movement. Um, you might see nystagmus effects on gaze. So patients will probably present with 
well, symptoms of vertigo, so nausea, vomiting, instability, changes to gait, all that sort of thing. Um, we talked about the labyrinthine artery running out to the ear and the vestibular apparatus. If, a, if a, an occlusion to those structures occurred, then again, you'd see similar symptoms. You'd see um, vestibular signs, so changes to balance and signs of vertigo, nausea, vomiting, and what have you, right? And of course, if the labyrinthine artery is affected, there could be an effect on hearing. Uh, the next pair of branches go to the cerebellum again, so same problems. So you can see that these symptoms overlap quite a bit. But if the clot was to continue up to the posterior cerebral arteries, then we're likely to see signs and symptoms associated with the occipital lobe. Um, so vision occurs here. Um, changes to visual fields, um, homonymous hemianopia, um, possibly with macular sparing because there is some overlap of the blood supply to these regions. Um, some of the, maybe some blood supply to the temporal regions. Um, actually, the posterior cerebral artery is supplying blood to the thalamus. The thalamus is the, is the sensory sieve, right? It's the sensory relay station. So there might be a contralateral loss of sensation from the opposite side of the body. There may be the development of inappropriate thalamic pains. There might be thalamic signs. So again, you're thinking of um, posterior circulation occlusion. So that's stroke. The other two things we worry about would be an aneurysm, in particularly a ruptured aneurysm, um, and a basilar skull fracture. Um, so um, an aneurysm would be a, a dilation of this blood vessel, often seems to occur where we have branches and angle changes, and a, a burst aneurysm would be a subarachnoid hemorrhage from these blood vessels. So classic subarachnoid hemorrhage, Thunder, you know, rapid onset, thunderclap headache, worst headache of my life, plus some of those other signs that we've been talking about. Basilar skull fracture, because of course this is, this artery is right up against the, the base of the skull in the cleaver. So a basilar skull fracture potentially puts these arteries at risk. And these arteries are crucial for life. Um, so the clinical side of things sounds really complicated, but go back to your anatomy. Remember the anatomy of the basilar artery, where it comes from, the branches that it gives off and the structures supplied by these branches and uh, the functions of those structures. And you will be able to use this knowledge step by step to uh, work out what the signs and symptoms in your patient mean. Okay, but the basilar artery, short, super important, difficult to remember the names of all the branches a little bit. Okay, I hope that was useful. I'll see you next week.